Hello, I'm Dan Gibson and welcome to another video in the series Archaeology and Islam. In this video, we are going to explore some of the challenges that face us when finding the archaeological record of the Prophet Moses. He is mentioned in both the Bible and the Quran. In the Bible, we have the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He's also mentioned in the Quran more than 130 times, which is more than any of the other prophets. Now, the story of Moses is fascinating because it starts in Egypt where the family of Moses, his mother and father and his sister, are basically slaves along with the entire uh, tribal group of people. Something has happened and they have fallen out of favor with the rulers of Egypt and now they're controlled and exploited, living a life of slavery uh, in Egypt. As a baby, Moses ends up in the courts of the king, adopted into Pharaoh's household. Years later, when he's a man, he has conflict with an Egyptian, and uh, he's exposed as being the son of a slaved woman, and he has killed this man, so he runs away and he lives in the land of Midian. Later, he returns with his younger brother, Aaron, and he leads the people, his people known as the children of Israel, out of Egypt, through the desert, until they enter into the Levant and become the nation of Israel. In the Bible, the emphasis of the story is on the slaves being set free and being made into a great people. But in the Quran, the emphasis is on Moses being called as a messenger of God to lead the people out of idolatry and into monotheism, thus making the story parallel to the situation that Muhammad faced. The Bible assumes that being the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel at that time were monotheists already, uh, and, but many of them have been influenced by the Egyptians and the polytheists among whom they lived. Now, there are several problems in finding Moses in the Egyptian history, in archaeology. First of all, um, the first part of his life, Moses was a minor figure in Pharaoh's courts. The Bible tells us he was an adopted son of one of the daughters of Pharaoh. The Quran only mentions the wife of Pharaoh. Uh, an adopted son is not a, in very high standing, so he certainly does not appear in any of the king lists. Second, as a young man, he ran away from Egypt. Imagine the scandal that might have happened as he ran away. One of the sons of Pharaoh runs away. For sure, no one knew, bef if they didn't know before, they knew afterwards that he was an adopted son of a slave woman. And so uh, nothing would be mentioned on the temple walls for sure. Then years later, he returns and he leads a slave revolt. Do you think that would be written down? Listen, most of the records that we have in Egypt are the writings that kings put on the walls of temples to celebrate their reigns. They wrote down all of the great things that they had accomplished. They wrote down the people they had conquered and the things that they wanted others to remember them about. What king in his right mind was going to write down that during his reign a whole group of slaves successfully revolted, led by a man who had been raised in the king's own courts? I don't think you're going to find Moses, so you shouldn't expect to find Moses in the Egyptian official records. So how will we find him? This is where the chronologists step in. These are the people who work hard on arranging the order of these kings or pharaohs. We have lots of different tombs, uh, lots of different inscriptions, with each pharaoh bragging about all the wonderful things that he did. But how do you get these in order? It's a lot of work. Now, what king follows another king? Sometimes one follows another father and then son and so forth. That's a bit easier. But sometimes there's a violent takeover and so some uh, maybe another reason for a change. And so the king dies and uh, without a son, maybe a new group takes over. So there's a break in the king list and a new king list starts. Maybe it only lasts one or two kings and then another new king list starts. Now, chronologists have another problem. 
they might have different king lists from different civilizations. And so how does one match up a king list from Egypt with kings in Babylon or kings in Assyria or what's happening in the Jewish record where there were not only kings at some point, but there are also a list of high priests? And what do you do when there's a civil war? And the nation is divided for a while and two kings rule at the same time. Or how about a takeover? Um, and uh, when one king is thrown out and another one comes in, maybe there are vassal kings or sub-kings who rule underneath them. And so there may be more than one king ruling at the same time. And there is another more complicating factor. This is called co-regency. In this case, a king set someone, most likely his son, on the throne, and they rule together for some years until the son is old enough to rule on his own. But the official king list just tells us that one king ruled after another king, and it gives us the number of years that the older king ruled, and it gives us the number of years the younger king ruled, but did they overlap, and for how long, and for how many years? Usually we are not told. So now we have a problem. First, we have multiple king lists of pharaohs that we are not 100% sure how they line up uh, with each other. And then we're not quite sure how long the king lists are in themselves because they're kind of elastic. They could be longer or shorter because there might be some overlap. Second, we're not 100% sure how these elastic king lists line up with other kingdoms. So when it comes to finding Moses, we have multiple theories about where he fits into Egyptian history. And that's normal. Um, this is, happens all the time as we look at history. Now along with this, we have lots of historians who insist that an absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. They say if there's no record of Moses in Egyptian records, then he didn't exist. And uh, if you try to contend with them, they simply point to the various theories and say, you can't agree uh, where he exists, and so that's additional proof. He probably didn't exist. He's probably just a fable or something that people made up. Now, those who believe in the prophets as messengers of God, and they have faith in the writings of the prophets, so they're interested in finding where Moses fits. Um, other people may not care so much, but people of faith do. Now, we know that Moses is a major character in the history of the children of Israel. So we're looking for a bridge between the history of the children of Israel and the king list of the pharaohs to see how they fit. But the children of Israel did not have a king at this time. It would be hundreds of years before the children of Israel had a king. Now, they had a list, but it was a list of high priests, not kings. There wouldn't be any king for another 400 years, and even then, the high priest list is more important than the king list. And this has been a problem for some traditional chronologists. Now, chronologists have one more big problem. Uh, around the change of the millennium BC, when Moses would have existed, there was a major invasion into Egypt. People called the Hyksos, or the Shepherd Kings, came into Egypt, and they ruled for a number of years until an Egyptian man rose up, mobilized the Egyptians, and then threw off the invaders, and then that Egyptian man became Pharaoh. So the question is, was Moses before the Hyksos? Was he after the Hyksos? Or were the children of Israel themselves the Hyksos? All three scenarios have been suggested by different historians. And to add to this, the Hyksos were people from the Levant. That is mostly from what is Jordan today. And they were a nomadic people with horses that invaded from the Levant into Egypt, hordes of them pouring into Egypt. Now, some people have looked at them and uh, looked at the Egyptian records and what they say about them, and they've decided that these Hyksos are very similar to the children of Israel, and they're right. They are very similar. And I've read multitudes of theories on this, and some say they were maybe the Amalekites coming in. Others say, oh, they were Edomites, and others say they were Canaanites, and some say, oh, those were the Ishmaelites who invaded. They all have good arguments. So, welcome to the world of archaeology and Moses. There is, um, uh, the study of chronology is, is so important. Now, where do I stand on all of this? 
Personally, I believe that Moses was born right after the war to throw off the Hyksos. I have lots of reasons why I believe that. And they're tied up with my study of Islam. And when I look at the Quran and what does the Quran say and what do other histories say. So I'm going to explain my position in very broad terms and very simply. If you're interested in more details, you can read more in the book Quranic Geography. That is because I believe the Hyksos were the people of Ad, uh, the people mentioned in the Quran. And in the, the last video, I associated Ad with the land of Ad, or the land of Uz, as uh, the English translation tells us. Uh, now, here's a chart uh, made from the Bible that describes the nations that emerged from the Middle East. It starts with Noah and his sons on one end, and it expands as we move along to the offspring of Abraham. This chart is just a, a map of what the Bible gives us in all of those long lists of so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so and so forth. My grandfather and my father worked on this and produced this chart uh, many years ago, and I found it very, very useful. Now, regardless to your opinion of this list, whether it reflects the truth or not, it demonstrates how the tribes in the Middle East saw their descendants. In much the same way, I have sat in Bedouin tents and listened to them giving their chronologies. They go back generation after generation, and it's important uh, to them. Is it important they're 100% correct? Well, what's important is to try to understand how do they see their own history? How do they see how their family and their tribe all fit together in the worldview of the Bedouin? Now, years ago, I lived with the Drausha tribe, and they were a sub-tribe of the Hawitat, and the Hawitat were just a large tribe that were a sub-tribe of the Bedouin and the different Bedouin groups that were there. Now, all these tribes have history that reaches far back into time. That's why this chart is important. It is showing us the history as the people would have seen it and as recorded in the Bible. I believe that on the right we have the people of Ad. The children of Israel are included in this list. If you remove the children of Israel because they are in slavery, the rest of the people make up the tribes that make up the people of Ad. This includes the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ishmaelites, the Amalekites, the Buzzites, the early Syrians. They are all cousin tribes related by blood and by language. And they unite into a federation of tribes, and they're joined by some of the Canaanites and other groups nearby. And together they become a large military force made up mostly of nomads. But more importantly, they were nomads with horses. Most of the settled people did not have horses. Uh, this gave these nomads, uh, this federation, a military edge. Their base of operation was around the Petra area going down into Wadi Rum. And they were known, this area was known as Imram rather than just Ram. Uh, it's Imram, the early name. And in, in Imram, there were uh, mountains with lofty cliffs that looked like pillars. Lawrence of Arabia calls them the seven pillars of wisdom after a term used in uh, Solomon's book of Proverbs. Now, this army invaded north into the lands we now call Syria and Mesopotamia. Remember Job? We talked about him. He was a famous person uh, among these this federation, and they would have told his story wherever he went. And Job, maybe he was even alive during part of this time. Whatever happened so many years ago, the memory of the people of Ad, or the people of Uz, they swear that Job drank from a well up there in Mesopotamia, and that story is still there to this day. From there, the nomadic army would have swept down south into Oman, and the people of Ad are famous, and Imram is remembered, those lofty pillars, along with the tomb of Job. And I've stood in the tomb of Job there in Oman, where everyone says, this is where Job died and where, where he was buried, and maybe it's true. From Oman, the army moved west into Yemen, and in Yemen, the people of Ad and the pillars of Imran are remembered, as well as the story of Job, uh, whose story would have been fresh, uh, still among them in their memory. And so, even to this day, people tell me, while well, I was in Yemen, about Job. Now this nomadic federation army had swept back up, having conquered all around Arabia, as they went home, uh, back up into this area, and then... 
they uh, began to expand elsewhere. So now the children of Israel are in Egypt and they're living there in peace. But uh, once the uh, Hyksos come in, everything changed. Now, the children of Israel were in e Egypt and they were looking after cattle. The Egyptians didn't like cattle. So the children of Israel lived in the land of Goshen. This is a green area in the delta of the Nile River and they were cattlemen. Now, when the Hyksos arrived into Egypt, I am sure that the lives of these uh, children of Israel was improved because these were distant relatives, these Hyksos tribes that came in. But uh, when the uh, Egyptian man rose up and united the Egyptians and threw off the Hyksos and chased them back into their home country, he became Pharaoh and a whole new king list started. With this defeat of the Hyksos, they, this federation of Ad, as the Quran describes them, they broke up and suddenly we have Edomites and Amalekites and other tribes, they appear in history. For the first time, a few buildings begin to appear and it appears as if the Edomites are very, a very small nation, which they are, as the armies of the federation have been defeated and now just the remnants survive to start again in different places. In the Bible, in the second book of Moses, known as the book of Exodus, Moses tells us that in Egypt a new pharaoh arose who did not remember Joseph. Now this is a key statement. Joseph was the one who brought the, his extended family into Egypt. But it was after the Hyksos were thrown off, the Egyptians began to look with suspicion on the children of Israel. They were distantly related to the people of Ad, to the Hyksos. And so a campaign began to subvert them and eventually enslave them. And into this situation, the man Moses was born. Now, why is this important? Remember, the prophet Muhammad is standing in Petra, talking to the people there. Uh, this is significant because the people of Av end up uh, settling in the greater Petra region. Everyone there would have known of the illustrious history of the people of Ad. And so uh, Muhammad, uh, this is very important to him. You see, in his worldview, there were three times the people of Arabia were united and became great. Muhammad had a dream, which he inherited from his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, that Arabia could be united again. But Arabia was divided religiously. They had no prophet. So uniting the people was of prime importance. And so Muhammad makes reference to these three times Arabia was united. Once under the federation of Ad, led by the Edomites. 400 years later, under a federation again of Bedouin tribes led by the Midianites. And you can read about that in your Bible during the time of Gideon. Then later, under the federation led by the Nabataeans. Now, Josephus claimed that in his day, the Nabataeans lived throughout the whole country, extending from the Euphrates River down to the Red Sea. And he refers to this area as Nabatini, uh, or the greater Nabataean area. And Joseph goes on to, uh, Josephus goes on to say, it was the Nabataeans who conferred their name on all the Arabian nations at that time. So Muhammad uh, refers to these people, but he calls them the people of Thamud. Tham meaning afterwards, making them into Tham Ud, or the people that came after Ud, or land of Uz, or the land of Av, depending on how you're taking the name. And so now Muhammad has a dream of uniting the Arabs again, and he as their prophet and as their leader. This is why he writes about the people of Ad, why he talks about Midian, and why he talks about Thamud. Uh, it, just as we might say today, the, Edom, uh, the Edomite Federation, the Midianite Federation, the Nabataean Federation, and this is all in the book, Quranic Geography. And so Moses becomes a key figure in the Quran, just as he is in the Jewish scriptures and in the Christian writings. More mention is made of Moses than of Abraham, and that's Ibrahim in Arabic. Uh, in the, uh, you, you find more about Moses in the Quran than these others. And just because we can't find record of Moses in the Egyptian history does not mean he did not exist. Memory of him is alive and well throughout the Middle East, in the records of the Jews and of Muslims and of Christians. Don't expect to find him on temple walls, or don't expect to find him in the king lists. 
because he led a uh, group of slaves out of Egypt and he revolted. And uh, the armies of Pharaoh uh, were destroyed in the river, although it doesn't tell us that Pharaoh himself died there. So we're not looking for a king who died in, uh, in the water. It doesn't tell us that specifically. It tells us his armies uh, perished there. And so we hunt for Moses and I believe we can find that Pharaoh and we can find that record. It's all in this book, Quranic Geography. So I'm Dan Gibson, and this has been another video in the series, Archaeology and Islam.